Anyway, back to San Francisco. The band broke up, so I came back to Reno, played at the Burley Bowl one night, and I got a call from Ronnie Montrose in New York City. He goes, hey, what are you doing right now? I go, well, I'm I'm making about a hundred bucks a week playing gigs here and there. And uh, he goes, how'd you like to make like 350 a week and go on the road with a really good band? I go, sure. He goes, well, we got, we got a ticket at the Will Call for, at United for you to fly back here to New York City. First time I'd ever been that far east. Mm -hmm. got, to, got to New York, and the first thing I did was I, I was looking up at the, all the buildings and just going, whoa, this place is a trip. Anyway, it turned out I was auditioning for the Edgar Winter Group, a new band. Edgar's band, White Trash, had split up or actually Edgar split off from them because he wanted to do a rock and roll band. He didn't want to do uh, uh, rhythm and blues anymore as such because we still did rhythm and blues in the Edgar Winter Group, but it wasn't our, our forte. We, we wanted to do something new that hadn't been heard before. And so uh, that's where I met Dan Hartman and uh, of course Ronnie, I knew Ronnie. And uh, he had come, he had just gotten off the road. He had been on the road with Van Morrison for a while, Ronnie had. And uh, then he was with Boss Gags for a while. And then he got, got invited to come and play with Edgar. And at that time, he had a, Edgar had a rhythm section with Stu Woods on bass and uh, Rick Murata on drums. And Rick Murata, I'm going, what, what do you expect me to, you know, like be Superman or something? I can't <laughs> replace this guy. This guy's killer. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want to go on the road anymore. They wanted to stay in, in New York City and do studio work. So that was the end of those guys. So we ended up getting Randy, Randy Joe Hobbs. God bless his soul. He passed away. Uh, Dan Hartman. He's passed away. God bless his soul. Uh, Ronnie, me, and Edgar. It was a five-piece band originally. I kind of got the gig, but I didn't really get the gig. It wasn't a solid thing because I kept auditioning drummers. Even after I, I was playing, I had been playing with them for six months. They were still auditioning drummers. And, I, and uh, we had already recorded Frankenstein in 1971. Now, Greg was telling me that Frankenstein is one of the most important drum solos of all time. Well, it's not really a drum solo. It was originally well, it's written for two drummers. Uh, oh. When Edgar was with Johnny Winter, mm -hmm. when Edgar was with his brother Johnny, he and the drummer with Johnny, I think his name was Tommy Shannon, or is Tommy Shannon. But anyway, uh, they, did a, uh, they did a duet. And Edgar Edgar charted it out, and they and uh, and Edgar would play drums. They'd have two sets of drums on stage, and Edgar would play drums, and and uh, Johnny's drummer would play the drums, and they would do. And they it was originally just called the double drum song, was all it was called. <laughs> Brought in uh, uh, a drummer named uh, 
Johnny Vandecheck from Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels to play on Free Ride, and we all had a real good time. So he's actually playing drums on those few songs on the record, but I played the songs a million times live. And we actually did re-record Free Ride two or three times with, uh, with Rick Derringer and Jerry Weems, who, God rest his soul, is, uh, was, had gotten into the band because of me. Because uh, after I came back to the Edgar Winter Group and actually got the gig for sure, I was going to be the only drummer because nobody could play Frankenstein. Nobody could play all the 6-8, and they just didn't have the feel for the song. And uh, it had become a, 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 an underground phenomenon on uh, college radio. That's, that's actually how Frankenstein became such a massive hit, is because all the college radio stations were playing it, not the, not the regular media. And uh, they, and it transferred over from there because they, because everybody wanted to hear all that synthesizers, all the synthesizers. It was all brand new. I mean, ARP 2600s were, that was like top of the line for taking on the road. Except they never did the same thing twice. <laughs> yeah. So if you move the if you move the input cable around, it would change the sound of the, the synthesizer. So Edgar, eventually Edgar got uh, the idea of putting a strap, a guitar, a two, he took two guitar straps, had them sewn together, and hung the keyboard around his neck. And the first night we did it, uh, he did that, was at, at uh, the Nassau Coliseum on Long Island. Uh, we were opening for uh, 10 years after, and... Uh, when Edgar came out with that keyboard hanging around his neck, the place went nuts. Mm -hmm. And then when we'd go into Frankenstein, he had his hands, he would have his hands painted with this clear uh, uh, fluorescent makeup paint that wouldn't run. And uh, with all the fog and everything that we had from the fog machines, He'd dim all the lights down and turn on these black lights right in front of Edgar, and he'd be playing all that. <laughs> People were just going crazy, and uh, uh, he was slamming that thing down on the stage and riding it like a like a little horse or something, and it was pretty cool. Uh, those were the, those were the beginnings of of when uh, Frankenstein first started really happening. Mm -hmm. That was like 1972, and the album came out in 73, right around my birthday, May 20, it was like May 22nd or something like that, and uh, the following year, we were number one on my birthday. Oh, that's awesome. And we were number one for two weeks in Billboard, Cashbox, and uh, uh, we, were, we were like the, the number one act on the road we had all these roadies and i mean i i never saw it was like it was like living in a hotel all the time because there were so many people around you know you go in the green room you go hey what quit eating all my food you know <laughs> quit drinking my beer <laughs> and uh anyway uh we go on from there uh, we toured all over with uh, Alice Cooper. We toured with Black Sabbath. We toured with uh, oh, just just tons and tons of bands. But uh, <clears throat> that that went on till about 1975. At, right after, uh, well, 74 Shock Treatment came out. And, uh, and when that came out, we had a lot of really good songs on it. It shipped gold, so we all got a gold album for it. We got a, we got a platinum for, for They Only Come Out at Night, platinum and a gold single for Frankenstein. And uh, we should have got one for Free Ride as well, but they, uh, it only went to number, I think it went to like number 12 or something like that. It didn't make the top 10. But uh, now you hear both of those songs constantly on the radio. I mean, I, 
I wish I would have could have got something in writing because I'd be really rich right now instead of kind of suffering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, that's another story. Uh, we won't go into that. The uh, okay, so uh, we toured with with Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath, um, got Ario Speedwagon. We were, we were headlining all over the place in seventy in seventy five and seventy six. Uh, we were we were headlining, and uh, Bad Company was the opening act for the whole tour. And I got to know I got to know Simon and Paul and and everybody real well. Uh, uh, Mick Rouse was always funny. He was always a funny guy. I don't know uh, how he's doing now, but back then he was great. Uh, I remember him when he played with uh, uh, Mott the Hoople, and uh, we did a lot of gigs with them too. When Ariel Bender was a guitar player, and then Mick Rouse. Or it might have been the other way around, but, uh, you know, you reach 60, you forget everything. <laughs> it's like I can't even remember how I tied my shoes this morning. <laughs> did I put them on the right feet? Yeah, I did. <laughs>